Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's MPG Primer session. I am very excited to introduce today Dr. Stuart Sevier. He obtained his PhD in physics with Herbert Levine at Rice University, where he studied the role of DNA mechan mechanisms in transcription. Since then, he's been a postdoctoral researcher with Sahan Hermuz at Harvard Medical School and Dana-Farber, exploring how researchers can utilize the mechanistic state of DNA to control biological function. Today, he will share with us his talk, Sources and Consequences of Gene Expression Fluctuations. Stuart has kindly agreed to take questions during his talk, so please post in the Q&A or raise your hand, um, and we will take your questions as they come. Thank you so much for joining us today, Stuart. Thanks. Okay, so um, yeah, the, the, the title that is, is up there is the Sources and Consequences of Gene Expression Fluctuations. So um, it might bring to mind a lot of things to a lot of different people. I, uh, I suppose a, a more uh, specific title and, and more accurate of what I'm gonna actually talk about is sources and consequences due to, to DNA mechanics. And I wanted to start by just going to sort of the, the classic starting point for talking about gene expression fluctuations and sort, and sort of trying to understand the, the drivers and consequences of changing levels of uh, RNA and, and proteins inside of cells, both where they come from, um, how they persist, and if they have any consequences. So back in the early 2000s, there were these really fun, really simple, but very revealing experiments where um, two different distinct dry, uh, uh, reporters were driven by the exact same promoters inside of uh, the same cells. And so you can see over here on the, the left um, in panel A, it's just a bunch of bacteria with differing levels of uh, reporters. And what it's really meant to do is sort of reveal if you have two identical promoters in the same cell, but they, they express different colors, it will give you an idea of how much randomness is due to things that are affecting both of the promoters in the same way, or affecting the promoters at different levels. And in doing so, they started to tease apart what people refer to as intrinsic fluctuations and extrinsic fluctuations. So the intrinsic fluctuations are those which affect the two promoters differently. And the extrinsic fluctuations are those that affect the two promoters the same. So that's why you get down here and the C that, that they're uncorrelated for intrinsic fluctuations and they're, they're very much correlated for extrinsic fluctuations. Now the intrinsic and the extrinsic combine together to, to result in the, the total fluctuations. So I sort of skipped over these time traces. So if you watch in time, these different colors, uh, which represent the different levels of, of RNA and proteins inside of the cells, you can see that uh, both the intrinsic and extrinsic fluctuations contribute to cell-to-cell -cell differences in proteins and, and expression levels. Now, the extrinsic contributions are most closely associated and attributed to environmental uh, differences in cell divisions and have time scales associated with that. And the intrinsic contributions are those which are like more inherent to the act of transcription and the act of translation. And um, have different sources and different different time scales associated with them. So today, you know, I'm really going to focus on these intrinsic contributions and sort of get at how the, the genome and, and, and gene regulatory mechanisms can contribute to fluctuations in specific genes that gives rise to uh, fluctuations in time for an individual cell or fluctuations in a population. Um, and uh, they can have, we're gonna try to first motivate like why that might matter and then go through, like I said, more of a DNA mechanics focused version of how they might uh, arise and then try to connect those together at the end. Okay, so, you know, fast forward 20 years into the future. This was just from last year from uh, Lear Weinberger's lab at UCSF. Um, they study really, really interesting consequences of gene expression fluctuations and really trying to understand how gene expression fluctuations might drive and control cell fate determinations. So this is just a, a cartoon of two different, same, very similar idea for the E. coli, 
where these traces represent the expression levels in time. And you can see that there's a, a, a low fluctuation in the top panel and a high fluctuating gene in the lower panel, and they give rise to different distributions. And what this is meant to illustrate is that um, if this gene is important for controlling plasticity or sulfate determination, the lower panel and the, 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 the representative gene here might be better at driving the cell to transition from state A to B because there's more times where the expression level is above some threshold which is required to drive this the cell into a new state. Now what they were interested in doing and did in this paper was trying to find what in the cell could drive both the mean expression level and the the fluctuations which people also call noise. So here they're just trying to illustrate how um, just with no no perturbations you have this low low level of expression with with lower levels of um, fluctuations where the uh, represented gene doesn't ever drive the, the state over this threshold you can enhance the fluctuations and some of them get over and you can enhance enhance the overall expression and more get over. But if you do them both together, you both enhance the expression level and enhance the fluctuations, then you can see that um, a, a significant fraction of the, the time or in the population, this gene is over the, the threshold. Now they they've actually did these screens and found um, a molecule that they ca called IDU, which did this exact thing for um, NANOG, a very important uh, uh, transcription factor for um, stem cells and cell plasticity. And you can sort of see that down here, um, without it, only 16% of the, the, the time were the, the cells expressing NANOG over this threshold, which they associate with, um, with um, being high enough to, to drive some state changes. But when they added the IDU, you can see that uh, they could drive uh, the, the nanog levels over into the higher threshold more more often. So the, the question is, you know, how, why, you know, what is IDU doing? Um, what can we, what can we uh, do to further our understanding and, and maybe further our control over these fluctuations and thus over cell fate determinations? So I'm going to go back to, you know, very basic textbook picture of how we model gene expression. So this is back into this, really thinking about the intrinsic contributions to uh, gene expression fluctuations. So in panel A is constitutive expression. So it's just, it's just a gene that randomly makes protein, makes RNA in time. And um, then the product gets translated, degraded, and gives rise to a, a Poisson distribution. So that's, you know, we can get into the to the math or just to reference it for people as a primer for get, getting deeper into um, what the underpinning uh, models and ideas are. But the important thing is that it doesn't account for uh, changing the fluctuations independent of the mean. So this Poisson distribution and this one state model of, uh, of, of gene expression, the has the mean and the noise, the fluctuations are very much intimately tied together and you can't really do anything about it. And there's no real potential for regulation beyond just increasing the, the mean expression. So the, a, a simple approach to regulation and a simple uh, way to get uh, some ability to control the fluctuations beyond just the mean are this two state model of gene expression where you have an off state and an on state. So in the off state, it doesn't make any uh, products and in the on state it does and it switches back and forth between these two states. Now again just for, for reference it's now we it, it generates a non Poissonian distribution and um, this, this distribution has higher fluctuations and through controlling the kinetics of the switching uh, you can control how much the fluctuations change in relation to the to the mean. Now really baked into this model and the, this picture is explicit 
bursting of the gene. So bursting and on and off are linked together. And so, you know, the, the immediate question is, well, okay, so you can see down here in the lower panel that, that, um, that the Poisson distribution doesn't do a good job fitting the experimental data anyway, so we need something else. And like, you know, in the previous slide, there's, there's clearly something else where you can drive uh, fluctuations beyond just the mean. Um, but the immediate question is like, do genes burst? Do genes turn on and off? Um, and are there time scales associated with that? And if they do, what are the underlying behaviors, kinetics, and, and mechanisms? So we're gonna, you know, sorry, you'll have to excuse my, you know, uh, cavalier, cavalier attitude for switching between um, organisms. Um, it, uh, most of what I'm trying to say is, is getting at something that is sort of universal to all sorts of different organisms and all sorts of different uh, systems. So we're going to turn back to simple model organism and bacteria and uh, using single molecule real time tracking, look at how gene expression um, uh, changes in time at a single low side for a single gene. So that's what uh, is shown up here is the, the actual imaging in time. So these green dots are tagged nascent RNA using this MS2 GFP construction. And when you track it in time, um, you see obvious things here like uh, like division, but and that's what I'm those are the extrinsic contributions. But um, interestingly, what you do see is you do see periods of uh, the gene being on and periods of the gene being off. So you can directly sort of visualize transcriptional bursting. And it's directly related to what I was talking about before, which is uh, fluctuations and, and, and variance in the populations in time for a single cell and then, you know, cell to cell variations. Now, um, just to really drive this home that this is really a generic property of um, all sorts of different organisms and all sorts of different genes, uh, it's, it's a lot of work to go through and, and sort of see and measure every single gene and every single organism. So what we can do is take uh, the try to break down and collapse these whole distributions into single single numbers that capture the relationships between the mean and the variance. So when you do that and you just take the, the mean and the variance and you construct um, what what's called the Fano factor. So the Fano factor is really interesting because it just uh, it, you know, some people like it, some people hate it, but it's a way to capture the deviations of the, the distribution above a Poissonian distribution. So it's a way to see how non-constitutive the, the expression levels are. So a final factor of one means that the variance is equal to the mean and you have a Poissonian distribution. So what this is showing is that for lots of different organisms, as you increase the expression level, you increase the fluctuations above a Poissonian expression level. So there's this relationship between the mean and the, the variance. And it seems to be true in, you know, in different contexts and in, um, in E. coli versus animal cells. Um, and so super Poissonian fluctuations are sort of a generic, a generic properties sort of driving home that, okay, so maybe we can see genes turn on and off and uh, in E. coli, we're not going to be able to do that across lots of different organisms and lots of different genes, but through uh, more high throughput methods, we can sort of get a sense of how ubiquitous uh, uh, high fluctuating gene expression is. So the, the question is really, this seems to be uh, present in, in, in many systems. Um, it seems to be related to some sort of transcriptional bursting that could be caused by lots of different things. And it seems to be important to, to sell fate and plasticity and we're really sort of left with this question of like what could give rise to such a generic phenomenon. So um, I'll kind of pause there to see if people have questions before sort of transitioning into the next uh, attempt at, at answering that question. So there's one, there's one in the chat. Oh, she just said good morning. So, okay. So I think we're, we're good to keep, keep going. Okay, so um, just taking a big step back and sort of trying to understand what are the common features of uh, DNA and gene regulation across 
different organisms. So this is from a, a nice review paper that wrote with Katie Galloway at, at, at MIT um, a, year, a year ago that was trying to look at all the different contributions to gene regulation, especially from a, like a mechanical sort of perspective. So at the smallest scale, obviously you have DNA binding events and very molecular events. Increasingly larger in time and in space, you have histones and domains that are forming um, uh, orchestrated by all sorts of chromatin architecture, little proteins and enzymes, and uh, you get larger and larger structures and sort of all of these together contribute to uh, the regulation of, of, of gene expression. Now, uh, I, as a researcher, I'm really interested in how these scales are related to each other and how they're related to function. And um, really bringing it back to the talk is, you know, what role does this maybe have in controlling the intrinsic uh, fluctuations in gene expression and all these non Poissonian uh, uh, characteristics of gene expression, which seem to sort of transcend any individual organism or any individual um, regulatory mechanisms or pathways. So, uh, sort of thinking of this as, as a sort of mechanical epigenetics. So, how does the mechanical state of DNA control gene expression? And there's lots of different parts that I sort of was outlining there before. So there's um, transcription factor binding and unbinding, histone binding and unbinding, histone modifications, there's larger nucleosome geometries, uh, replication, topoisomerases. But really, we're going to just start really basic and just think about what the act of transcription it does to the mechanical state of DNA and what the mechanical state of DNA does to transcription. And again, we're going to switch just into our simple bacteria mind and just think, sort of forget about for now histones and, and uh, all sorts of other really beautiful and really rich regulatory mechanisms. And just think about what would it look like if a gene was governed only by the physical act of transcription? So I was, I'm not the first to sort of pose this question. Uh, Lu and Wang uh, started thinking about this in the, in the 80s. And the reason why it's interesting is sort of here in this GIF, you can see that, um, that as the DNA is getting pulled through the polymerase, so I should just say, you know, uh, this is, this is a, a cartoon of a polymerase and the, it's uh, transcribing. So it's, it's moving, translocating along DNA. And as it does that, it spits out the transcribed RNA uh, out its backside. But the reason why it's an interesting physical process is that to do this, you can see that the DNA has to rotate as it's moving along. And because of this, and don't, don't worry, this is what you know, I'm gonna try to spend the bulk of the talk getting into is that this really introduces a very, very rich um, interplay between the polymerase moving and the DNA twisting. And um, Lu and Wang called this the twin domain model of transcription. So it's a two domains because in front of the polymerase, um, the, the twisting introduces, it introduces over, over twisting and positive torque and behind it, uh, negative twisting and negative torque. So those are the two domains. And so this, there's a lot of DNA physics, which, you know, this is a very broad audience. So I'm going to try to just uh, talk conceptually and use a lot of uh, figures and, and illustrations to sort of get what I'm talking at and minimize the, the uh, equations and the, the, the uh, mathematical approach. But uh, I'll sort of give references. And if anybody has specific questions as we get into it, just let me, let me know. So the, the main point is that, you know, to make it a little more precise, is that uh, RNA elongation has to come through a combination of DNA twist and or RNA polymerase rotation. So to make this very, very clear through illustration is, you know, as the polymerase moves through the gene, either the DNA can twist, so 
in that case, the polymerase stays still and the DNA moves, which is what was going on in the illustration. Or, and, and so this is sort of the, the, the as much math as I'm gonna cover is that um, the amount of twist is accounted for and has to match with the amount of built in linking in the, the DNA itself. So that's every, every 10-ish base pairs, again, for, for naked DNA, the two strands wrap around each other one time. So those numbers have to match with each other. So if the, the polymerase makes X distance amount of RNA, then X times that number, that density of, of twist has to be accounted for in the, the DNA. And that's just a basic topological mathematical conservation of the twist in DNA and the amount of rotation that has to occur for the RNA to, to move, RNA polymerase to move along. But it could be that the polymerase does all of the rotation. So there's no reason, and in fact, there's no, the, you know, you shouldn't expect that the polymerase should just sit still. Like, why should it just sit still? So instead, the, the polymerase couldn't do all of the rotation and the DNA sits still which is the exact opposite of what was sort of shown in the, the, the basic illustration before. Um, but the same topological constraint conservation of the, the DNA twist has to happen. Now, um, really they're both free to happen. And a lot of my, my PhD work was to try to understand the, the physics of which would occur. Would the DNA twist or would the polymerase rotate? And I'll just sort of say that the, 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 the thing that links them together is that this conservation of um, DNA, mechan uh, DNA topology, the, the natural linking number, you know, of how many times per base pair that the two strands go around each other. Um, but, but I'll sort of move on and not go too much into the, to the DNA physics and try to get back to the consequences and sort of the, this really interesting process that's gonna really underpin the driving of the intrinsic fluctuations that we really want to get back to. Um, and um, I should say that the reason why this is really interesting, and I think that, that it's really behind a lot of uh, really cool uh, uh, effects is that this twisting leads to torsion and it's very, in which can then, uh, which then propagates along the DNA and can affect things non-locally. So the, the movement of one a polymerase, one location can affect the binding of, uh, of, of transcription factors and histones in another location. And then polymerases can interact with each other. And that's because the, the, the DNA twisting propagates along the, the strands. So this is like a little fun video um, where you know he's not thinking about DNA physics or anything, but it's sort of just, spooling this long string and um, it's just winding all around. So you can imagine this DNA inside of a cell and it's just all over the place and there's all sorts of stuff going on, but the, 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 it's linked together even through this winding path so that when he's driving one in with the drill someplace very, very far away you know, he's, he's stirring pasta, but you can imagine in the cell, it's just some completely unrelated or seemingly unrelated uh, DNA process, which is responding to the twisting of the DNA really far away. So, um, so stop, stop this. So it's a very interesting type of interaction because it's cis acting, but it's also very long range. So, um, does it have any role in gene expression? And um, if it does, you know, does it have any role in genome organization or even more specifically, you know, cell, cell fate determination? So back to the, the simple picture and uh, just to try to illustrate why this is a really interesting thing to think about. Um, we're gonna imagine, to make it simple, that the, the DNA is uh, completely uh, restrained from, from rotating outside of the, the gene body. So you just hold it still. 
the reason why that's uh, interesting is that when the uh, polymerase moves along, because the, the nascent RNA doesn't want to allow the polymerase to move freely, so this is back to the sort of DNA physics, what it causes is over twisting in front of it and under twisting behind, which causes these two domains to form. So the, the DNA is now over twisted. So it's more than uh, uh, going around each itself uh, once every 10 base pairs and under. So it doesn't, it goes less than one time around itself every 10 base pairs behind the polymerase. So we call this, you know, over twisting and under twisting, and it's related to positive and negative supercoiling. The reason why that's really interesting is because it causes torsional differences in, in, in the DNA, and a lot of DNA-based processes respond to the torque. So the over twisting causes positive torque, and the under twisting causes negative torque. And this can propagate away from the, the polymerase. So um, the, the first reason that we should care about this is, is just transcription itself. So I'm gonna walk through how the elongation can couple to other polymerase elongations and couple to initiation itself. Um, so just imagine sort of the, 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 the life of a polymerase, if you will, as it's trying to transcribe. So it loads, it starts to elongate, but as it elongates, like I'm saying, it starts to increase the, the torque because of the, the supercoiling, the, the over and under twisting. And as it does that, the polymerase will stall because it can't melt and move along the DNA anymore. And so it'll just sit there. And it, you know, there's, I'm gonna just ignore total isomerases, which can, can rescue it. Um, but it's, so it caused itself to stall, but it also changed the local, uh, you know, so it's here somewhere down in the gene. But back at the promoter area, it changed the local mechanical state of DNA, which can increase the rate of initiation, causing further loading and further elongation, which can in and of itself change the, 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 the torque in the DNA, both where it's at, but then in other areas, rescuing the first polymerase, and then they move along but then the same sort of story happens again, they stall and sort of around and around it, it goes. So the restricted DNA rotation leads to over and under twisting, which introduces these interactions and this rich interplay between initiation, elongation and stalling, which is sort of fundamental to the act of, of transcription. Now, again, this is obviously not the whole story. There's a lot of things like top isomerases, epigenetics, genome organization, which contribute and control this. So I'm, I'm not unaware, um, but just trying to build up a, a picture of what could be so common that you could see it in so many different organizations or, or so in so, so many organisms and try to get at this very basic sort of um, coarse understanding of what might be able to control cell fate uh, at this high level from this very basic bottom up uh, uh, description. So we were just really talking about this active transcriptional contribution. But it, it's even though it's very simple, it's not without its nuances and its 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 beauty. So you know, um, it really offers this ability to affect things non, non locally, as well as the sort of left hand illustration of introducing all sorts of um, sources of regulation within a gene and between genes. So um, I guess I'll pause there to see if anybody has questions before trying to go back to. Um, so there's no questions in the chat, but I, don't I have know one question for you, okay. Stuart. Yeah. Um, and I guess this is just from um, from the data analysis perspective, and you may be getting to this in the future, but how do these, are there one or two aspects of typical transcriptional analysis that you feel like should be better informed by these mechanisms? Um, you, 
Yeah, so um, so there's a couple. So so I'll, I'll, I think that maybe maybe um, that's a good question. And that in these these two effects that or these, I'm going to go through three effects. The first is the, the one that I first introduced and it should be obvious. So I think that's leading to what the real point of the, the talk is, is that there's this high level cell fate readout, which isn't um, so precise about, um, but it's big and important. And then there's these low level, very engineering watching single molecules at a time and so it'd be nice to build out the connection between these high level things and these low level things which is i think maybe what your question is is aimed at and um so i'll maybe come back around to it um i think i'm doing okay on on, on time too um yeah so back to the um and get to, to sarah's question which is a good question but first you know back to this original motivation for the relationship between fluctuations in gene expression, especially important genes and cell fate determination. So um, I said that they did these screens and they found um, that this molecule IDU could both activate and uh, enhance the, the noise of something really important like Nanog. But I didn't really go into like what IDU is, like what is it what does it do? Like who, who cares? And so there's a big feature of this paper is that what IDU does is help regulate the, the, the mechanical state specific, you know, the supercoiling of genes in cells. And um, they did a lot of work to, to show that this was true, but it's still very high level. So you can start to do draw pictures where the IDU interacts with other DNA mechanically trans regulating um, molecules to help uh, increase or decrease these transitions between the on and off states, which I sort of outlined at the beginning. So this is a sort of picture that they're starting to, to draw, but there's still a big gap between the mechanistic, very physics model -y building up of a real picture of transcription and this widespread high level cell fate determining uh, uh, relationship and, 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 and consequence. So, um, you know, effect number two, which is, it, which is now dropping back down to, the, to the, the bursting and getting into what, you know, been doing more recently. So this is work uh, that's still on the bio, the bio archive from late last year uh, with me and Sahan where we, we constructed a, um, a model where for the first time there was DNA, the, the act of transcription, which actively changed the uh, supercoiling, the over and under twisting of DNA and um, RNA initiation all together. So we could really study this relationship between elongation and initiation and put them all on an even surface. And in doing so, you can start to disentangle contributions from initiation versus elongation to bursting. So what I mean is like, it, you could imagine that the bursting or the fluctuations in gene expression are totally due to initiation, that just in time, the, which is closer to what people were imagining with the two-state model, that the promoter just turns on and off in time. And so what the, 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 the real reason why you get these intrinsic fluctuations is because of initiation turning on and off. Um, but you could also imagine, like I was outlining, that because of uh, elongation and the stalling of polymerases, that there's a contribution to the um, fluctuations in gene expression due to clustering, and um, as well as the the, the polymerases uh, stopping and starting. And um, in this work, we sort of were able to, for the first time, disentangle these different contributions. I'm going to go relatively fast through it, and but you, you know, please go look at the, the paper and try to get at what aspects of initiation versus what aspects of elongation would give rise to the types of fluctuations and the relationship between the mean expression and the, the fluctuations in the expression that are observed in, um, in, in actual experiments. And we were able to do uh, as well as their combined uh, contribution, both the effect of initiation and the effect of elongation, and sort of get at, like I said, this really ubiquitous relationship between 
the mean and the, the fluctuations. So that might be a good you know point to maybe come back to Sarah's question a little bit, which is like what um, what are these uh, the so um, so at least start to maybe answer some of the um, questions of what what measurements could we make or what should we look for in gene expression data, which uh, uh, is is maybe a signature of this relationship and this intrinsic relationship. And so I haven't really driven home um, the signature, which is um, that as you increase the expression level, you you have this relationship. So if you can imagine these are, this is, you know, simulation data, but just this line. So it's sort of like a, 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 a you know, they, they drew the line here, maybe it's better here, is that for increasing expression levels, you have to follow along this uh, increased level of fluctuations. And uh, in the, the, the science paper, the, the self-fate determination paper, what they were really interested in doing is finding um, the, the molecules which changed sort of the slope, if you will, of this, this line. So how could you keep the same mean expression but increase uh, the fluctuation. So I'd mean like driving it up here, or how could you uh, keep the fluctuations the same, but increase the means? That means like moving these dots over. And so this, this paper is a, an attempt at understanding the, the mechanisms that might drive it over or, or up. In terms of uh, what to look for in, in data, um, is precisely you know what they're sort of doing here. This is fish fish data, but you know probably a more modern version is like single cell RNA seq data or you know single cell, uh, uh, whatever data, and you can capture these same same sorts of effects in the single cell RNA seq data, because here they're they're doing it through fish, but you could do it through single cell RNA seq where you can construct distributions and then uh, sort of tease out statistical properties of those distributions uh, due to cell to cell variability in the, the RNA copies. And if you were to perturb the system or be looking at a disease or something like that, what you could try to understand is the relationship between how this, the fluctuations in a cell, the, the copy numbers of RNA in a cell are related to the mean expression within a cell and the, the, the distribution across cells. And maybe there's rare cell types or rare cell states where you have both a high mean expression level and a high fluctuation level. And so you could see that in single, single cell um, data sets, which might really give you uh, an indication that it's these intrinsic fluctuations that are driving a given cell's ability to make a transition or, you know, is the reason why it's diseased. So um, in the last, you know, couple of minutes, I'll just sort of go relatively fast through a couple other effects and then sort of, you know, give a little bit of time for um, questions. So uh, getting a little bit more exotic and a little bit more in the physics -y world, but it's really, I think, really interesting is that, like I was describing, these polymerases can interact with each other non-locally and in doing so, their uh, elongation rates become coupled with each other. And um, that causes cooperative elongation to happen where they assist each other as they move down a gene. So um, these are sort of simulation traces of the velocity, so the elongation rates of polymerases in time. And what's interesting is that the number of polymerases that are transcribing at the same time affects the collective um, uh, dynamics of the entire group of polymerases. And this is seen in experiments where uh, as you increase the, the rate of initiation and thus the average number of, of polymerases on a gene, the average elongation of the whole uh, collective increases, which is a really interesting type of traffic uh, and we're, you know, you can think of it as a little bit like drafting or something. So we call them polymatons, like like a peloton, where the polymerases interact with each other and assist each other moving 
moving down the, the, the gene body together. Um, and sort of the final effect, which is building out. So this is the gene to gene. Uh, uh, and so this gets me to another thing to look for uh, in expression data is that the uh, genes can affect each other just through the, the DNA mechanics. So before we've been thinking more about within a gene, how polymerases can affect one another and affect the, promotion, the promoter of the gene that they are transcribing. But this effect, as I was trying to illustrate, can extend beyond genes. So on the left, this is in, in bacteria, where what they have is an inducible gene, so they can control the expression level of that gene. And they have a, a reporter gene, which is, um, I won't go into the details, but it's really important how they're um, oriented relative to one another. So um, if they're uh, transcribing into each other, in the same direction or divergently from each other will affect how much they're coupled to each other. And what this, what they're sort of showing is that as they drive the expression of the left-hand gene, the right-handed gene follows along, but they aren't directly controlling the right-handed gene at all. And nothing that the left-handed gene is making is, is going to increase the, uh, transcription of the right-handed gene. All that's happening is that just by transcribing and transcribing at increasingly high levels, they can force the right-handed gene to follow suit. So you get this gene-to-gene -gene cooperativity in, in, this, in this configuration where you can drive neighboring genes transcription just through the act of transcription. Um, this is a, a more recent paper. Um, uh, that's on the bio archive uh, where they look in yeast and they do a similar thing. And this is using single molecule techniques. And they, they did a really nice job of having uh, cis acting. So uh, genes next to each other and transacting. So they're on different chromosomes, you know, different, very far away from each other. And they sort of see that when they're close to each other on the same piece of DNA, there's uh, correlations. So this is the exact same sort of thing is that the activity of one gene affects the activity of another gene. And when they aren't on the same piece of DNA, they're, they're uncorrelated. So some of the theor work, theoretical work that I, I've been doing, and there's other, other papers that I won't be able to, to mention from other groups has been starting to understand this. And it has the possibility of all sorts of really interesting interactions and potentially novel, you know, bioengineering capabilities which we sort of outlined in the paper, but back to Sarah's uh, uh, question, something to look for that's really interesting is uh, spurious correlations between genes, which don't seem to have any uh, uh, regulatory or known regulatory reg relationship with each other, but happen to be close to each other on uh, DNA or on a chromosome. This is sort of known and, and sort of thought about in different ways where gene neighborhoods sort of form. And just by the act of being close to one another, they, they antagonistically or cooperatively interact with each other. And so that sort of leads me into, you know, you know, I like to say that DNA mechanics might be, you know, the dark matter of transcription, that uh, it, it's sort of uh, this background uh, uh, level that sort of is driving a lot of unknown relationships between genes and a lot of unknown relationships between the fluctuations of genes and the mean expression of genes. Um, and really encourage people to, to, to try to look for it either directly or through, you know, um, motivated, inspired uh, 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 probes into to data sets, so relationships between genes which don't make sense in, towards, in, in terms of any known pathways, but might make sense if you sort of consider their relationship to each other on DNA itself. And, um, you know, this is, you know, maybe more for the, the tool development crowd, but, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for just having it in your head is something that might be there as you're going through data sets. And, um, you know, I think that integrating synthetic bottom-up tools and, 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 and data sets and perturbations of gene expression will allow for us to sort of connect this high level cell fate determination to this low level, um, uh, really mechanistic picture of, 
of what's driving intrinsic fluctuations in gene expression. So that's that's all I have. I think that I, I left enough time for for some questions or some comments if there if there are any. Great, thank you so much, Stuart. Um, please, anyone who has questions, feel free to type in the Q and A or raise your hand, and we can unmute you to voice your question. Um, I guess I'd like, I, I'm just interested in what, what brought you to think this way about DNA in particular, because obviously there's physics of, of every molecular interaction and uh, uh, what was it that made you particularly interested in, in transcription? Well, I mean, it was, it was very much that, you know, I was just in my PhD and it was really like um, uh, Ido Golding, who was one of the first to, to look at this transcriptional bursting. Um, was across the street from where I was doing my PhD, and he just sort of noticed these these uh, sort of what they call universal uh, relationships between gene expression and, um, and and mean gene expression and fluctuations of gene expression. And I was a physics student, and so I did what a physics student would might be inclined to do, which is like, okay, well, what is transcription, and you know what are the basic elements of transcription like what is a picture that i can build for myself in my head um and uh, a lot of it wasn't in textbooks the way that you know all laid out together but like i sort of started with like people for a long time had been thinking about sort of the, the basics of, of of dna and its consequences in replication and in transcription and i always like to say too like um you know, it's really under underappreciated the, the power of theoretical biology and the power of prediction that, you know, is on the level of physics. So Lewin Wang, who, who came up with this um, twin domain model of transcription, um, were the first to discover top isomerases, which I haven't talked a lot about, but play a really important role in, in all of this. And top isomerases weren't discovered until 20, 30 years after the, the, the structural parts of DNA were, were understood. And there was a big debate between all of the discoveries of DNA and, and DNA replication that, hey, how can you have this double helix and then you have semi-conservative replication where the two strands are then tied around each other. It's gonna create a whole mess. Be like, okay, well, it seems like it's true. These things have to exist, which cut the DNA and pass them through each other and glue them back together sort of predicting top isomerases. And it took 20 or 30 years for, for people to discover them. But now, of course, it's really, you know, top top isomerases are really appreciated as a really fundamental element of understanding cells, cell replication, cell fate, their targets of cancer drugs and all sorts of stuff. And so I just sort of took that as, as inspiration of like, okay, well, maybe if you just understand these really basic elements and and Again, you know, you can have really silly, silly, simple pictures of what's going on, but they might inform, you know, allow you to do something like predict topor isomerases. And of course, it's going to look very different and, and be very different in any given context. But the idea that something like a topor isomerase has to exist, you can just get from imagining the basic elements of how DNA, the basic elements of DNA. Um, uh, 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 um, helixes and replication. And so maybe you can get a lot of the same sort of thing by just the basic elements of transcription and uh, the helical nature of, of DNA. So that's sort of like why I was motivated to, to think this way about things. Great. And there's one uh, question in the Q&A. Yeah. said, great talk. Sorry if I missed it, misunderstood. But for the effect on nearby gene, on nearby genes, any idea how far away such effects reach? We often see in knockout models that nearby genes on the genome uh, that, that are nearby to the knocked out gene are differentially expressed and wondering if this process could yeah. relate to that. Yeah, it's definitely, definitely could be related. So, um, uh, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of work in the, um, in the eighties um, with like really old techniques, which was looking at this exact sort of thing is like as you as you remove a gene like what happens to the neighboring genes like how do they reprogram themselves they can definitely move over 
many, many kilobases. It's sort of an open question exactly how far, but I would say it's, you know, at least a medium range for force. Like definitely it could propagate to um, genes that are, are, are tens of KB away. Um, we need better tools to understand how precisely that happens. Um, but the, the evidence, especially from, I think, the synthetic biology world is that there are big consequences for either integrating new genes in or, or removing genes to the uh, to the genes around it. So it's, you know, in synthetic biology, you'd call it a compositional effect, um, and um, it definitely has the power to to do. I think precisely what the question asker was 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 getting at, which is that it has unintended consequences, and and so that's sort of what I mean by like the dark matter of transcription is that the 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 that well it has consequences right but it was there the whole time and it may be actually what was responsible for or, or really important in the the regulatory pathways to begin with and it just is revealed to you once you knock it out or you try to integrate uh, a new gene into the into the plate you know into a new position and in synthetic biology um there's there's all these like safe harbor integration sites right and and a lot of that is precisely to avoid compositional effects, both for the endogenous genes, but also for whatever gene that you're trying to, to integrate for whatever reason. And I think these two things are very much intimately related that um, when you knock out genes, genes on either side and around could sort of go a little haywire, but it's a big, you know, it's decades of, of potential research for, for, for really getting, getting at it, but it sort of points to my last, my last point. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your talk today. It was a wonderful contribution to our primer series um, and look forward to hearing more of your work in the future. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you.